Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brian Robson, the Medical Director here at Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And welcome to this, the first in our QI Connect series for 2018, the 40th session since QI Connect started. As you recall, QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health, social care, academia and beyond to learn from international leaders in the field of improvement, innovation and integration. We've designed these sessions to be short, accessible and recorded uh, to be used at a time that suits you. I'm now going to pass you over to Jennifer who will talk you through a little bit about the technology we'll use this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Jennifer. Thanks, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone on the call. Um, I've just got a couple of quick housekeeping slides to get started. If you could please use the chat function that you see on the right-hand side of your screen to communicate, and I'll talk you through this in just a moment. If you are having any technical difficulties, such as not being able to hear the presenter speak, or if you keep losing connection, um, then please message the event manager using the chat function or pre by pressing star zero on your telephone keypad. Um, so we would just remind you to, when you are sending a message using the chat function, if you could just click on the um, icon for chat at so the top right hand side of your screen, circle there, looks like a speech bubble, and then type your message and make sure you send it to all participants so that we can all see it throughout the top of the talk. So we did promise that today's session was going to be fun and interactive, and we're keen to find out where you're joining us from today. If you could please select the annotation tool that you see circled in red on the left hand side of my screen. Mm -hmm. Then click on the arrow icon. And then click where the country where you're joining us from today. So Scotland is majorly filling up. Hi to Simon and Sophie. We'll just give others just a, little, a couple more minutes just to join. I know there's a slight delay with other countries. Yeah, great to see so many uh, um, QI connectors from across the UK, and uh, nice to see you there, Simon, in London. Um, and we've got some uh, colleagues joining us from across the world as well. Hi, Colleen, good to have you uh, from Canada. Uh, Catherine Calderwood's a bit, okay, Catherine, good to see you. Uh, great, great to see so many uh, QI connectors uh, joining us uh, from across uh, the world. I look forward to seeing your chat. Uh, nice to see uh, Aileen Kelman uh, saying hi to Nigel. Uh, Nigel Packham, many of you remember from the uh, wonderful um, uh, session at the end of last year at the uh, Planetarium. Uh, and uh, thanks again for that great uh, uh, introduction, uh, Aileen. So welcome, um, uh, welcome Liz. Uh, Middle of the Indian Ocean looks a bit nice and warm. Um, great to see so many people here. So again, welcome to, uh, to QI Connect. And QI Connect, as you know, has gone from strength to strength. We're almost up at 700 uh, organizations that now connect in uh, to QI Connect, either directly during the calls or make use of the uh, recordings uh, afterwards. Uh, but remember, uh, competition, always a competition with uh, QI Connect. And with the, uh, with the countries that we now have uh, joining QI Connect, uh, we'd like to just get you to identify one of them. We have 53 countries that are now uh, joined up uh, connecting in. So I'd like you to use the uh, arrow icon again, and the first person to find this flag uh, will get a wonderful prize. And the flag for today is India. Oh, well done, Alistair. Uh, Alistair Philp, uh, fantastic to see you come in there, Alistair. Very quick, uh, you're, you're closely followed by uh, a group of other folks, and Alistair is an information consultant at National Services Scotland and uh, an advanced uh, QI, Connect, uh, uh, QI connector over the last few years. So, uh, Alistair, you'll be delighted to hear um, that uh, the, the, the big prize is a QI Connect mug, and that will be winging its way to you over the next couple of days. Um, but again, just a big shout out to all of the QI connectors uh, that connect in across our almost 700 organizations. It always makes us smile to see so many of your wonderful logos. Uh, we now have almost 20 slides of, of wonderful logos. 
and it's always a great um, a, a great joy to us to see them uh, as we uh, start every QI Connect session. And of course, it's always uh, a, a big highlight of ours to shout out some of the organisations that are joining us here for the very first time. Uh, so great to see the Edinburgh International Science Festival uh, joining us, and also uh, Cafe Motorino. I hope I've got that right, uh, from uh, Santiago in Chile. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, QI Connect. Always great to see so many QI Connectors uh, join in. And of course, we're always uh, delighted to say that uh, NHS Scotland, the whole of NHS Scotland, uh, joins with us in QI Connect. It's always a great uh, privilege uh, to be able to connect uh, using QI Connect across the whole of the, uh, the system here in Scotland. We're also very proud of our connections across uh, the universities. Um, we're looking at now uh, 60 or 61 universities that are now joining, um, and your wonderful logos are, are with us. Um, great to see so many of the uh, faculty and students across the universities who make use of uh, the recordings and join us live. Uh, really uh, great to see so many of you here. Uh, and a special shout out today, and this will become clear in a moment, to uh, William Thompson, who's the current chair, and Christina uh, McNeil, uh, former chair from Glasgow University Aviation and uh, Space Medicine Society. So a big shout out to, uh, to that society at the University of Glasgow. And just to remind everyone that uh, all of the recordings uh, are, uh, uh, sorry, all of the sessions are recorded. Uh, and this was something that was uh, flagged up to us as being very useful by our colleagues in, in uh, Middlemore in New Zealand, at the Koawatea Institute. Uh, but I, we know that many people across the world uh, use the recordings. And all of these recordings are freely available uh, to, uh, to listen and download uh, at uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland's uh, website. Please uh, take a look. We've got an amazing back catalogue uh, of uh, talks. And we're also delighted, of course, to uh, be a continued uh, uh, resource for the Institute for, so the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, the ISQA uh, um, organisation for the fellowship programme. So a big shout out to the ISQA fellows from all over the world. And the partnership that we started in 2017 and have continued this year uh, with the Health Foundation, uh, with the Q initiative uh, across the UK. Uh, developing capacity and capability in quality improvement in health, social care and beyond. And also a big shout out to our friends at NHS Improvement in England. Uh, the QI Connect team, the small but perfectly formed QI Connect team, uh, you've heard from Jennifer. Big shout out to Michelle, who's in the studio with us today uh, for helping with uh, running QI Connect. Uh, Jess, who's uh, running in terms of the certification work along with uh, Carmen. Uh, who's working on certification as well, and Alex Sterling, uh, who's in the studio also, uh, who's uh, helping us with, uh, with Twitter. We're also joined in the studio today by uh, Katrina er uh, Ingram, uh, who's a Scottish Clinical Leadership Fellow, uh, who's uh, working here in, Scot in uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and also working with this lady, uh, our Chief Medical Officer here in Scotland, uh, Dr. Catherine Calderwood, and we'll come to Catherine a bit later in QI Connect because Catherine is, is going to be the uh, first questioner uh, of our speaker today in QI Connect. Oh, um, great to, to have so many people on board. Uh, and remember, please tweet uh, about uh, QI Connect at the hashtag HISQI Connect, and you can follow us at HISQI Connect. Uh, and that brings us round to today's uh, speaker. Now, I guess last year we, Healthcare, uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland through a QI Connect helps to connect across the world, and we went uh, into uh, outer space at the end of last year uh, with Dr. Uh, Tom Marshburn uh, and also with uh, Nigel's wonderful talk at the Planetarium. Uh, and uh, we've started this year in pretty much the same orbit. We're absolutely delighted. Uh, to have uh, Dr. J.D. Polk, uh, who is the Chief Health and Medical Officer of NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, J.D. is an uh, emergency uh, physician, emergency medicine physician, 
uh, qualified in, in, in managerial studies and also uh, qualified in aeronautics uh, medicine. Uh, JD is, I think, Jennifer, our first Scottish QI Connect uh, speaker. We haven't had a, QI, a Scottish QI Connect speaker, and when I say Scottish, JD's uh, great-grandparents came from Renfrewshire, from Renfrew, just uh, in the west uh, here in Scotland. It's del we're absolutely delighted uh, to have uh, JD with us. Uh, good afternoon, JD. Good afternoon, Brian and Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, Dr. Calderwood, thanks for uh, allowing me to to uh, take the stage here and, and give a, a really fascinating story to us here at NASA. Great. Now, JD, I've just handed the ball over to you just now, and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, about the work that uh, NASA and uh, and others did uh, working in the Chilean uh, mining disaster. Over to you. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. And, and really, this is uh, this is my cheerleading for the uh, both the uh, Chilean healthcare folks and the Chilean government and all of the innovation and collaboration that they did. Now, you might wonder why am I not talking about how we do astronaut healthcare with our aggressive preventive medicine and personalized healthcare and our clinical practice guidelines and checklists and all of the predictive modeling that we do. Uh, and that's you know part of that is so that uh, Brian will actually invite me back. Uh, at some point. And I see that uh, you know, Atul Gawande and Toby Cosgrove are going to be talking later this year, uh, and they're talking about pieces, parts, uh, and a lot of uh, what we've worked with those two individuals with uh, to help develop our NASA healthcare. And so I think it builds on that in the future. But really what I wanted to concentrate on this time was, was this story, because it's a remarkable story that the Chileans uh, pulled off uh, to get 33 miners uh, out of the mine, which had never been done before. And, and looking at Dr. Calderwood's strategic plan on how to manage risk better and how to do shared decision making with patient care, et cetera, this is kind of that on steroids. And so um, you'll see that I'm uh, pretty excited about showing what our, uh, our Chilean brethren did down there in the healthcare industry down there. And we were allowed to, uh, to go and consult with them, and, and it was our privilege to, uh, to go and consult with them. But this is really their triumph and not NASA's. But, uh, you know, when the movies come out and all the things come out, it doesn't really sing a great a deal uh, about the health care that went on behind the scenes. And so I'm going to give you a kind of a behind the scenes glimpse there because these folks are, that really did a remarkable job and it, and it highlights some of the things that Dr. Calderwood has is, is, uh, set out in her strategic plan. And so let me take you back a little bit. Uh, so you're the consultant. You get called uh, by the Chilean government to see if you'd be willing to consult. There are 33 men that are trapped in a mine 2,400 feet below solid rock, and they, they range in ages from 19 to 62. And by the way, the 19-year-old had only been on the job a day. Uh, so I, I'm not really sure what what kind of, you know, that, that gentleman needs to go out and buy a lottery ticket because he, he needs luck somewhere. Because can you imagine signing up for a new job and only been there a day and have this uh, event happen? Uh, but they also had known medical conditions in the minors of type 2 diabetes, uh, silicosis, hypertension, coronary disease, and COPD. Uh, and so when this collapse occurred, uh, remember, Chile is in the ring of fire. They had had an earthquake about six months earlier that had loosened a massive amount of rock that had not fallen yet, but about a 600,000-pound rock, if you will, uh, that will fall into the mine and, and trap the miners. And so one of the things about this is you know, these miners are deep down at 2,400 feet, uh, and and they are buried essentially by when this rock falls. The Chilean government and the mining company, they thought this was going to be essentially a body extraction. They did not initially expect to find the Chilean miners alive. And, and they were drilling pilot holes down, and, and it's hard to hit the, the mine when you're drilling a pilot hole from 2,400 feet above. Uh, because as you can imagine, the rock uh, sometimes makes the bit sway left or right. And so it's, it's kind of like threading a needle. They're trying to find uh, and poke a hole into the mine to see if they can look around and see if the miners are alive. And uh, on one of their attempts at about uh, day 16, 17, they poked into the mine finally. Uh, and they, they had a tug on the end of the camera, and when they pulled it up, this note was on the end, uh, which says, we're alive in the mine or the refuge, the 33. 
Uh, and so if you can imagine what's going through the Chilean uh, minister's mind, the, uh, the uh, mining company, all of the folks, uh, there, there's probably a, a dual fold, um, you know, they're probably first elated that the miners are alive, and then there's this, oh my gosh, uh, they're alive. Now, now how are we going to get them out of there? And so this, this beset a, a huge orchestrated event for them to try to figure out how to get these folks out of here. And so on this slide, this kind of shows you what the mine looks like and that the mine zigzags back and forth uh, to allow the trucks to bring the ore up. Uh, and you can see from that uh, graphic on the lower left that the miners were about 2,400 feet down, and you can see where the rock had, had collapsed. This is, this, we're talking 600,000 tons of rock. This is not something where the miners could have dug themselves out. Um, and it's worth noting that this is a gold and copper mine that is about 100 years old. Now, why is that important? Um, you know, if you have a mine like a coal mine, uh, that emits a great deal of methane, and so, uh, which is a very poisonous gas, and you don't find a lot of miners alive after a, a mine collapse in the United States that is a coal mine. But in a gold and copper mine, not a lot of noxious or toxic gas there, uh, but, and since it's 100 years old, it's got a lot of different, uh, you know, back shafts and other things that allow for some ventilation there. And so that's something to point out initially is, is why, you know, why weren't they suffocated? Why didn't they die of hypoxia? Uh, you know, that's one of the biggest reasons right there is because this was a 100-year-old gold and copper mine. Now, you know, it's, the Chileans were very novel on how they went about this, and, and they deserve huge amounts of credit. And that one of the things they did initially is they said, okay, who else keeps people alive in an enclosed space for a prolonged period of time. And there's really only about two groups that do that. The Navy, uh, when you think about submarines in, the, in an enclosed space underwater for a long time, uh, and the space program. Uh, and so the they, Chilean ambassador had, had called and come across the street here at NASA headquarters and said, hey, would you be willing to consult with us? And of course, uh, you know, NASA is kind of scratching its head thinking, well, we don't really do mining, but yes. And so, uh, you know, we, we went down, there were four of us actually, myself, uh, Dr. Duncan, Dr. Al Holland, uh, and uh, a gentleman who was an engineer from uh, Langley, uh, NASA Langley. And so we went down to the Chilean mine, and one of the, I was enamored with some of the things that they did to at least uh, allow this to occur. And part of, the very first thing was probably from the leadership standpoint, is they decided to make this a very flat and powered leadership chain. Um, and so literally uh, in the lower left box is myself, Dr. Duncan, uh, and the Chilean Minister of Health. And then if in the upper left box, you see the Chilean Minister of Health, the President, and the Governor for the region. Th that was their leadership chain. If they needed something in the mine, if they needed something from a healthcare standpoint, uh, they only had to go a few rungs uh, to, to get up to the very top to, to get the resources that they needed. And so. You know, this was a really good structure from a disaster management standpoint was to lower that and get rid of that bureaucracy and, and empower the leadership chain. And we need to do that in healthcare more often as well. The other thing that we did, one of our recommendations initially was to look at this in phases, uh, to break this down into bite-sized chunks. The initial incident, uh, the survival of the miners, sustainment of the miners while we're trying to dig them out, rescue, and then the recovery and reintegration. The reason we do that is, is when you have a very complicated, huge, you know, multitask uh, mission like this, it it's, can sometimes be overwhelming. Uh, but if you break it down into small bite-sized chunks, it becomes much more manageable. And, and you can put a leader at, at the head of each one of these segments, and it becomes much more easily managed. Uh, and so we do that in space flight, uh, and this is where part of that recommendation came from, was that we have a launch control team and people that launch the shuttle uh, or the rocket or uh, soon to be SpaceX and, or, or, and Boeing and our new SLS rocket at the Cape. And that's done by a launch control team. And then you have the survival uh, phase, uh, you know, having the astronauts survive in space and sustain themselves with exercise and their food, and et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, for coming home, we have a landing team as well that only does landing uh, and landing ops and recovery of the crew. 
Uh, and so they, they only have to concentrate on their particular segment, which makes it much more easier uh, to do from a technical standpoint. And that was one of the recommendations we did here as well. And so that made this more manageable, I think, for these folks. But remember, these are 600,000 tons of rock collapsing into the mine. And so when you think, what are the two things that kill a majority of mine victims? The first one is trauma. Uh, you hate to be the guy or gal underneath 600,000 tons of rock when it falls in. Uh, and the second one is asphyxiation. And fortunately, uh, when the rock fell, it was uh, at a segment or above them, and so they did not have trauma. Uh, and as we mentioned before, this was a, a somewhat uh, leaky, for lack of a better word, aerated 100-year-old uh, golden copper mine, not a, not a coal mine. And so asphyxia was not a problem. But you still want to make sure that they don't get stale air. And so one of the things that they did was begin to pump down uh, fresh air uh, to the miners. And, and so, you know, when you first have that initial incident, you can get what's called a, a blast overpressure. Uh, think about that mass falling into the mine. All of a sudden, uh, you can get a blast pressure, almost like an explosion. And the thing that you worry about from a medical standpoint with blast pressure uh, is several things. Anything that's an air-filled structure. Uh, and so you, you worry about things like the tympanic membrane. You worry about the intestines uh, and et cetera. Um, and so this is one of the first worries that they had was, you know, was there asphyxia, was there, uh, were there lethal gases, were, and so they did air sampling and they started to pump fresh air in. Uh, fortunately, they did not have a huge amount of blast overpressure uh, because this mine was leaky and 100 years old. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's a very important thing because when you have that blast pressure, uh, one of the best ways that you can actually triage a patient to know whether or not you're going to have to intubate them due to pulmonary contusion uh, and then pulmonary edema is to ask them if they can hear. Um, and so if you're at a scene of an accident and you say, can you hear after a blast uh, of any type and someone is having problems hearing, if there was enough blast pressure to rupture their, their eardrum, then there's enough blast pressure to rupture their alveoli. And so you have to worry about them going into ARDS or a, you know, adult respiratory distress syndrome about four to five hours after that event. And so you need to kind of eyeball that person uh, to see if you're going to need to intubate them and do things like oxygenation uh, and jet ventilation for those folks, almost like you do with a burn patient when you look to see if they have burn or soot around their mouth or their nostrils. That's kind of the same thing. And so. First, I have to tell you, you know, who are the first people to save the Chilean miners were the, were the Chilean miners. Uh, you know, this is 17 days before they were found. And there's a rule of three in survival, usually in survival situations. Uh, you've got about three hours to find shelter if you're in a bad place, like in a winter area, or et cetera. You've got about three days to get water before your kidney starts to shut down and you get dehydrated and suffer. Uh, and you've got about three weeks to find food before you, uh, you know, die from a lack of nutrition. Uh, and so, you know, they didn't have much time when you think about it to actually get water. And so uh, they had a, they had a uh, you know, a disaster supply down there in, one, in the refuge, but it wasn't very large. And it didn't, uh, you know, it certainly didn't have enough supplies for 33 people. Um, and so one of the things that they had to do was, was to start to dig wells. Now, remember, I said they're 2,400 feet down, but when you think about it, they were, this particular mine is in the mountains, and so uh, the, the miners themselves were actually at sea level. Uh, the mine, the entrance to the mine is actually up at altitude. And so the, the miners are close to sea level, and so just by going down uh, one of their levels, they can start to get and dig uh, wells to start to get water. Um, and they also started to divide up the rations. And, and fortunately, they were able to do both of those things uh, to allow themselves to survive, uh, to get to that 17-day mark. Otherwise, they would have perished by about the three- to six-day mark. So they themselves were, were very ingenious uh, and showed great leadership in how they saved themselves initially. Now, when I say they divided up the rations, uh, they had several cans of food and, and things in the refuge, but when you divide it among 33 miners, it, they actually came down to about a teaspoon of tuna, uh, a quarter of a peach, and a teaspoon of milk every other day. Now, if you read the back of a tuna package, you'll, you'll figure out that there's only 100 calories in a whole package. So if you can imagine a teaspoon of tuna and a quarter of a peach 
and a teaspoon of milk every other day, as well as you know their sips of water from the from their wells, yeah, you can quickly figure out that they're not getting enough calories and they're in a starvation mode. Um, and they, you know, you finally have what's called a paloma. A paloma, and uh, you know, if there's anyone on from Chile, they can correct me on this one. But a paloma is Spanish for pigeon or, or a carrier. That's for this pipe that we were using with the small. Uh, little torpedoes, if you will, to send down to the mine. And you could only send something or a, a package or, or this little torpedo that would go through this four inch round tube that was only about five to six feet long because the tube was not perfectly straight due to going through the wavy rock. Uh, and so you, you didn't want it to get stuck. And so you could only put so much stuff into this uh, little package or torpedo to send down there to them. Um, and that was called the Paloma, where we would have these four-inch round tubes to start to send down to them. So if you think about it, you're the, you're the consultant, you're about to send food down, what's your initial concern? Well, the initial concern for someone that's been starving for quite a long time, especially now 17, 18 days, is what's called refeeding syndrome. Uh, refeeding syndrome, if you think about when you're starving, your brain starts to switch to ketones, uh, and you have all of these things that allow your body to survive, but you use up liver glycogen and you downregulate insulin. Well, well, what do all of those things mean? That means if you gave somebody a large carbohydrate load, uh, that that would cause a huge shift, both potassium but also in phosphorus, and that's called refeeding syndrome. So initially when you refeed someone that's been starving, uh, you don't want to give them carbohydrates, so you don't want to start shoving uh, you know, moon pies and ho-hos down, uh, down the Paloma, if you will. Um, you want to be very cautious about how you refeed them. And you have to go low and slow. You don't want to give them 3,000 calories off the bat. You want to start with 500 calories. And it needs to be mostly protein-based until they build up their stores again so that you don't have these massive electrolyte shifts. And, and how do we know about refeeding syndrome? Well, we know about it partly from, from our experience in the, in the intensive care unit and with patients that, have, that are in a starvation mode, someone that has uh, alcoholism or someone that has had head trauma, and now you're putting them on, on ter you know, total parenteral nutrition or TPN, uh, and you're refeeding them. But we learned a lot also in World War II, and unfortunately, we learned it the hard way. If you think about it, the Holocaust victims, uh, if, as you came across uh, Auschwitz, if you can imagine a 21- or 20-year-old soldier uh, stumbling across Auschwitz, and here are these starving people, these folks that are emaciated skeletons, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to give them your candy bar and your Hershey bar and your food, et cetera, uh, and unfortunately, uh, we we unfortunately caused the demise of several folks uh, and several of those uh, Holocaust survivors by not feeding them correctly. And, and if you've ever seen the, the show, uh, I think, uh, Band of Brothers uh, on HBO, where they, they actually did a great representation. After the, the first or second, uh, you know, where they finally found uh, one or two of the first two concentration camps, uh, after that, the word went out through the medical community there, and they telegraphed to the officers not to refeed those folks. And so it, uh, in that show, they showed that they actually kept all the, all the uh, Holocaust victims together, uh, you know, still behind the fences so that they could feed them properly and, and not allow the soldiers to start giving them candy bars and things. And so that's the reason that we do that. And the reason that you worry about that is the thing that really causes the main electrolyte disturbance in refeeding syndrome is actually phosphorus. You would, you would think potassium, uh, and we're all, you know, you know, when we see diabetes and diabetic patients, we all think about the low potassium. But, and in refeeding syndrome, phosphorus or hypophosphatemia is actually the first thing that occurs. And, and what you get when you have a hypophosphatemia or a uh, change or derangement in phosphorus is actually heart failure to start with. Uh, and it makes sense. When you think about uh, phosphorus, uh, most, you know, phosphorus is kind of that unsung electrolyte, but it's one of those things, uh, especially if you're in medical school, uh, you know, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Uh, and so every cell, including your, your muscle cells of the cardiac tissue, work off of ATP. And if you don't have the phosphorus uh, to augment and put together ADP to ATP, uh, then you're going to have heart failure and those cells don't function well. And so 
you also have the other the, the other electrolytes that are that get messed up, the potassium and magnesium, uh, and you also worry about uh, the vitamin that gets used up uh, due to the fact that you've used up so much glycogen in the liver, and that's thiamine or B1. And so what you really want to do when you start feeding them is initially you're going to feed them this protein uh, and lower calories and work your way up to higher calories and work your way into the carbohydrate, uh, and you're going to add phosphorus and potassium and thiamine. Uh, and the Chilean health uh, communities did that remarkably. And, and when I say remarkably, there's a risk. Uh, you know, you think about a refeeding syndrome in a, in a population. You've got 33 people starving. Uh, the likelihood that you're going to have one or two people with severe derangement of electrolytes is pretty high, but they did it in such textbook fashion uh, that they didn't have a single one that was in refeeding syndrome. So you think about, you know, the, when the press talked about the Chilean miners being saved, they talk about them, you know, rising up out of the mine uh, and being rescued. The Chilean miners were actually saved multiple times. The first time they were saved by themselves. Uh, by digging those wells and making sure that they had enough water to survive. The second time now uh, by the Chilean health community because the way they did the refeeding on a, on a group of starving miners was textbook to make sure that they did not uh, have any issues with the electrolytes. And so they did a great job there. And so this is, you know, some of the things that we talk about in survival and refeeding syndrome uh, one of it is we worry about things like increased CO2 production. As you start to you know, feed people, you, you, you kind of are what you eat, uh, but there's this thing called RQ or respiratory quotient. Uh, if I eat all protein, uh, I have an RQ or respiratory quotient of 0.8. If I eat all carbohydrate, I have a, a respiratory quotient of 1. What does that mean? That means if I'm eating all protein, I consume more oxygen and I produce more CO2 uh, if I'm eating more carbohydrate than if I'm eating protein. Um, so you, you actually take in more oxygen and produce more CO2 with carbohydrate. You take in less oxygen or metabolize less oxygen and less CO2 if you're eating protein. And that's one of the reasons we do TPN, or total parenteral nutrition, for patients in the ICU, and we try to balance the amount of fats and carbohydrates and protein in that. And that's based off what's called the Harris-Benedict equation. Uh, and so you might think, okay, why would NASA know all this stuff about RQ and Harris-Benedict equations and all of those things, and where would that come into play? Well, you know, one of the things that we do and I'll show in a slide, uh, you know, later. One of the missions that we had uh, before, you know, the shuttle repro program retired is we had a hidden mission that never launched. And the hidden mission that never launched was called the STS-400 mission. And this mission, its only purpose was to go and rescue uh, a stranded shuttle crew. So if you can imagine, after the Columbia accident uh, with the hole in the wing, uh, the president and the NASA administrator said, well, great, if you guys are going to fly the shuttle again, you've got to have a way to rescue that crew. And so one of the things that we, we built was this rescue mission. And, and one of the, because you can't just launch a shuttle whenever you want, uh, one of the, you know, we had to make sure that the astronauts were going to survive on orbit in the small space shuttle volume for about 30 to 45 days. And that meant that they were going to have to decrease their calories down to about 500 calories a day, and we were going to have to shift their RQ to 0.8, i.e., they were only going to be eating protein, so they wouldn't produce as much CO2 or consume as much oxygen because those are consumables in a spacecraft that we have to either get rid of or make more of. And so those were things that we had actually calculated for each of the astronauts down to their you know, body weight uh, for that particular rescue mission if it were needed in case the shuttle was ever stranded. And so we were able to bring a lot of that knowledge uh, to our Chilean uh, you know, health associates and work with them on, on you know, how they would do the refeeding and, and consult with them on that. But again, they did a textbook failure, and not a single miner had hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, cardiac arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, or cardiac failure. So that, that is a huge, huge deal, and they did a great job with that. Um, and unfortunately, none of the books or none of the movies about the Chilean mine disaster really go over that and talk and give great accolades to the Chilean medical community, and they really need it. Um, so initially, 
uh, what were we going to send down there? So you know we have to send down something with high protein, uh, but we have to replace phosphorus and, and, and magnesium and thiamine. And so when you think about things, you think about some of the same liquid nutrition we give uh, you know, patients uh, in the ICU, things like Insure and Insure Plus um, and Supportan. Uh, and so initially I think we start off with Insure and Insure Plus because of its high, uh, you know, high protein and, and high potassium and phosphorus and magnesium. Uh, but it eventually settled on Supportan for a couple of reasons. Supportan had a higher protein and got us closer to that RQ, uh, but also had a higher phosphorus content. But also, to be honest, it was a long, skinny bottle, and so it fit in that Paloma really easily. Uh, and so it had some uh, logistics uh, standpoint that made it uh, helpful as well. And again, this was all, you know, part of that knowledge came from the fact that we were going to need uh, potentially to rescue a shuttle crew if they were ever stranded on orbit uh, for a mission such as the Hubble mission where you can't get to the space station. Uh, the Hubble missions were at 300 nautical miles uh, and at a, a, you know, a different altitude and a different attitude uh, compared to the space station. And, and unfortunately in space you can't just turn around and, and unlike Star Wars where it makes it look like you uh, can zigzag in space and and uh, just whip your space uh, vehicle around. It really doesn't happen that way. It requires a home and transfer and a lot of changes in vector to get to the space station if you were not already already aligned uh, with that orbit. Uh, and so we had to figure out a way that we would rescue those astronauts if that were the case. And so literally we had calculated uh, exactly how much oxygen you would use and how much CO2 you would produce. Uh, so we would know exactly when the astronauts would run out of oxygen or when they would exceed our ability to scrub CO2. And if you can tell by this graph, this is one of the ones we actually used for that mission. Um, you know, if you decrease the calories, if you take in less calories, you produce less CO2, but you also consume less O2. Uh, and if you change your RQ uh, to more of a protein diet, you produce less CO2 and you take in less oxygen. And so those are the things that you have to look at and that, and we even calculate now, in fact, uh, in our requirements for a spacesuit, we're building a new spacesuit for the new vehicles, uh, for the new SLS and Orion. Uh, and when someone's out on a spacewalk for seven hours, uh, we actually can calculate based on an RQ of 0.9, which is the midway between in a mixed diet, how much CO2 they will produce during that seven hours. Uh, and so we can figure out based on their BTUs, uh, their body weight, their body composition, and their RQ, exactly how much that astronaut will produce in CO2 and how much they will consume in oxygen so that we don't run out of oxygen during that spacewalk and so that we don't exceed their ability to scrub those things. Um, and so all that science uh, actually comes into play. So all of you that are sitting there at the uh, uh, you know, University of Glasgow Medical School lamenting why do I need to learn all of this stuff with lipids and RQ and protein and carbohydrate, uh, I remember distinctly in medical school uh, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, I'll never use this ever in my life. And suddenly, here it was. Um, and so, you know, who else gets refeeding syndrome? Neurosurgical patients get refeeding syndrome, especially anybody with greater than five to seven days of malnourishment uh, can get refeeding syndrome, and that's why uh, TPN without uh, adequate phosphate is, is a problem in those patients, and they, we always have to add phosphate to folks that uh, are starving. And so, you know, here they are, they're now saved twice, but here's, here's the next complication. They're in a mine that is 90 degrees and 90% humidity. Uh, and plus, there weren't sleeping quarters there. They had not intended to sleep there because you work on the mine and you go home. And so the miners were actually sleeping on hot rock and vehicles and just about anywhere they could. But the problem with that uh, is you start to break down muscle and you start to get rhabdomyolysis. Well, you also get rhabdomyolysis and breakdown of muscle when you're feeding on muscle and starving. So if you can imagine, they are having large proteins uh, of muscle proteins bombarding the kidney uh, from rhabdomyolysis. And so what test would you use to test for that? Well, 
you would think there'd be some, you know, really scientific whiz bang NASA test that we would use. It's actually a simple urine dipstick that you use to, to test for that. One of the flaws of a urine dipstick was actually used to our advantage here. A urine dipstick can't tell a difference between myoglobin, which is the breakdown of muscle, and hemoglobin, which is the byproduct of blood. And so we went on a, a you know, we, we decided, well, you know, the likelihood that all miners are having a kidney stone and putting blood in their urine is probably zero. So anybody who tests positive for blood or hemoglobin on the urine test strip, we can probably safely assume that that's actually myoglobin and they're in danger of rhabdomyolysis. And it turned out 50% of the miners were positive for myoglobin. So if you can imagine 50% of that of those 33 people now in danger of what's called acute tubular necrosis or renal failure or kidney failure, which could also uh, cause the electrolyte disturbances and, and kill someone. Um, and so the Chilean medical community targeted those folks for consumption of five liters of water a day. And remember, now we're able to get fresh water via the Paloma down to them. And so that we're, we're having them drink a ton of water for those 50% of the miners that were positive for myoglobin. And so now after that, after about several days of that, uh, we could see that the urine test strips were starting to clear. In fact, by day four or five, they had totally cleared. So now, the, the miners have not been rescued yet. They're still in the mind that you've saved them three times. You say, first they saved themselves uh, from, you know, due to the lack of water. Then you saved them on the refeeding syndrome. And then now you've saved half of them, uh, you know, at least 16 of them from kidney failure uh, by hydrating the daylights out of them when they were having this severe rhabdomyolysis. But, you don't want this to reoccur. You don't want them sleeping on hot rocks, so you got to get them off of the rocks and get them sleeping on something. And this is one of the things where I think the Chilean government was just uh, just awe-inspiring in how they did this. They, as you can imagine, they had the press making inquiries left and right to them, wanting to know how the miners were, and how old were the miners, and all of these things. Well, they decided to reverse it and say, well, let's let's put something out through the press wire. And so they put an innovation challenge out. They said, you know what, we need a cot. And we need a cot that'll fit in a four inch round tube and only be less than six feet long, that'll fit in this Paloma. Uh, and by the way, we need it by tomorrow. And you would be surprised, and they put that out through the press wire and several companies started answering. People had invented or could invent a cot that could be taken apart and sent down in those pieces. And, and you don't have to have 33 cots. If you're going to have shift work, having some of the miners work to clear some of the rubble from the drilling and to make sure that the, you know, keep watch over things, uh, you can split it up into two shifts. And hot rack folks, uh, only half of the miners are sleeping in a cot at a time while the others are working and, and back and forth. And so essentially, uh, they were crowdsourcing solutions uh, using, uh, you know, innovation through the press wire, uh, which I think was extremely novel on their, on their point. But then it didn't stop there. They, whereas the United States and several other countries, you know, if we have a disaster and somebody offers to help us, we're like, oh, no thanks, we got this. You know, talk to the hand. Uh, the Chileans took the opposite tact, and I think that was brilliant as well. They decided, okay, yeah, come on down. In fact, uh, Let's make this a competition. Let's see if we can get three different drills started and, and see who can reach the miners first. Because, you know, for us, it's about, you know, rescuing the miners. It's not about whether, you know, who gets there first. And so they had several different drills uh, and different types of drills uh, working at, uh, at levels to try to get down to the miners. And then, uh, fortunately, these drills were going, and each day, if you can look at that board that's behind me here, I'm the, you know, swarthy-looking guy with a beard back there, uh, which I no longer have, by the way, but I was trying to look, uh, you know, suave. Uh, but you can see these, these three, three things that are the different drills, the A, B, and C, that we are looking, and we monitored each day which, which level they were at. Um, now, another thing to think about, so these drills, when you're drilling through rock, you can imagine that drill beat, that drill bit heating up, right? I mean, you're, you're drilling through rock, so it doesn't take long before that drill bit heats up. 
Uh, and so what they did is they drilled pilot holes, so a very small hole with that one drill bit to get all the way through into the mine as a pilot hole and then follow it with the larger drill that's about 26 to 28 inches across uh, to, to you know, bring the miners out. But uh, what happens to all the shards of, of rock as that drill is, is you know, drilling is some of the rock is falling through the pilot hole, and so the miners were clearing that. But also, because you have to cool the drill bit so that it doesn't break, there, you know, there's a ton of water being sprayed on that drill bit uh, to make sure that it's not going to break due to all the heat and stress from drilling through the rock. And that water is actually, you know, at first it gets scalding hot uh, hitting the drill bit, but then it cools as it's coming through the rock, and then it comes into the mine. So the miners essentially had showers uh, based off these three drill bits and, and the pilot holes. So you had you know, fresh water that was essentially sterilized by the heat of the drill bit coming into the mine, and so they essentially had what amounts to showers. And if you remember how the zigzag pattern for how the trucks bring the ore out, that zigzag allowed the water to flow down to the very to the lower depths of the mine, uh, and also allowed for them to dig latrines that allowed for you know urine and feces uh, for to drill in, and that water to you know, flow those downhill as well so that they weren't having to contaminate their living quarters or their sleeping quarters with that. And so we would do a brainstorming sessions each day to figure out where we were and, and what we needed to do next. Uh, and then you know, the one thing you have to worry about is sustainment. What if there's another earthquake? What if more rock falls uh, and we're cut off again? So one of the things that uh, that they had to do was start to, start to send down medical, water, and food supplies uh, as a store in case for any reason there was another earthquake or another problem that would then cut them off again. Um, but the other thing that you have to be weary about is, remember I said the drill bit is about 26 to 28 inches wide. Uh, you also don't want the miners eating too much uh, because if they get too big uh, you know, and, and become obese eating anything down there, they're not going to fit in this tube to bring them up. So you're trying to hit a happy medium. So if you can imagine, now you're the doc and you're trying to treat some of the chronic conditions, uh, something like type 2 diabetes, for example. Uh, and you, know, you have a patient with type 2 diabetes on metformin prior to the accident. Would you, would you give them metformin? Uh, you know, they're, they're already in rhabdomyolysis. What are the concerns that you have physiologically? Uh, well, you worry about metformin having lactic acidosis as a, uh, you know, a sequela to its, uh, you know, you, it just in normal patients, much less a patient trapped in a mine who's starving and have rhabdomyolysis. And so uh, we considered that that person was diet controlled uh, for their type 2 diabetes since they had been starving for that period of time. And so, you know, you really don't have to worry about replacing that medication until they're no longer spilling ketones, they're no longer acidotic, and they're taking greater than 1,800 calories a day. Uh, and so the, one of the other things that, that came about was these folks had these lesions on their skin, and, and it looked like they had eczema, and, and they were treating it with steroids, and, and it, it just didn't seem to be going away. Well, when you're starving, you can also get linoleic acid deficiency, and it has a very, uh, you know, ex eczema-like rash. It can also cause neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, but it looks almost exactly like eczema. If you look at that, those patches on the elbow and on the back, you would swear that that's eczema, but that's actually linoleic acid deficiency. Uh, and so once they, they started to be hydrated uh, and were fed uh, with nutrition and supplemented, uh, with linoleic acid as well as the phosphorus, uh, this went away. And another thing, when you're stressed, you know, and buried in a mine certainly is stressful, you can have latent virus activation. So you think about college students or anyone who's under stress taking an exam getting a herpes sore, and that's from reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus or, or the herpes virus or herpes type 1 virus. Uh, you can get reactivation of all those herpes virus families, whether it's Epstein-Barr, herpes virus 1, et cetera, which could cause mono or it could cause cold sores, it could cause all sorts of things. Uh, and so we needed to worry about that as well and be on the lookout for folks that were having latent virus activation to make sure they didn't get shingles uh, and, and any other sequela from latent virus activation. 
And one of the things that they did, which initially they got a lot of grief for, uh, but really I think was very smart, is they did vaccination down in the mine. And folks were like, oh my gosh, what are you giving them vaccines for? And what if they have a vaccine reaction? But you got to remember, you've got 33 people living in very close quarters. Uh, and, you know, you're in the middle of flu season there in Chile, uh, and several folks have immune compromise, and they've also got other diseases like COPD, et cetera. And so they, they went ahead and gave them tetanus, uh, for example, uh, pneumococcal vaccine and meningococcal strains, uh, as well as their influenza. And, and I think uh, that was a great idea, actually, to make sure and prevent any secondary impacts uh, that could have complicated this uh, rescue for them or any other healthcare impacts that could have complicated the rescue. And of course, you know, this is a uh, zoster and that's one of the things that they're trying to avoid. And so, uh, and then sending down, you know, uh, you know the uh, medications that would treat for zoster and antivirals uh, for anybody that had evidence of reactivation. Um, and of course, they're in a darkened mine. You have to worry about vitamin D deficiency after a while, especially if you're going to be trapped for a total of 65 to 90 days. And initially, they did not think they would get them out till Christmas. Uh, fortunately, it was not that long. Uh, initially, they were projecting maybe 90 days, but it, it took them 67 days to get to them and get them out. Uh, and so these were all the things that they had to worry about. They had constipation, they had respiratory infection, skin infections, latent virus activation, dental caries, and periodontal disease. And so they were treating all of these things in the sustainment phase to make, get the, the miners healthy to make sure they didn't have other sequela or infections that would cause complications. Now, this is one uh, on alcohol and tobacco. You know, initially, uh, I, I was kind of being a, a prude about this and being a little bit more religious about this one and saying, okay, you know, you know first of all, they've got uh, glycogen deficiency and thiamine deficiency, so no alcohol. Uh, and so we didn't do any alcohol intake initially. And then I said, and you know what, they're in a mine and we've got people with COPD, no tobacco. And, and Al Holland, who's my psychologist at NASA, leans over and whispers in my ear and says, they will kill each other. And so he was kind of letting me know, you know, there's a, there's a time and, and place to have a hill to die on and, and fight for, and uh, maybe this wasn't one of them. And so uh, eventually uh, I think they got one or two cigarettes uh, sent down to those folks that really needed it for mostly, you know, to allow, because we didn't want to, you know, we had to choose our battle essentially on some of those. Um, and uh, if the miners were demanding it, uh, we weren't going to, you know, just be ardent supporters of health uh, at the cost of their uh, their psyche. Uh, and so we had to pick which of the psychological support things we would do. Um, you had to worry about, from a psych psychological standpoint, the circadian and sleep-wake cycles, because now they're in a dark area of 24 hours a day. And so they, you know, started to string lights uh, and to, to try to get, at least in the work area, uh, they would have a, a lit area, and then in the sleeping area, they would have a dark area, uh, and this, uh, and have several miners on different shifts so that they could start to cycle and get back into a circadian rhythm. Um, and we also had to make sure that they had uh, some communication with family. And, and but there's a happy medium on how much communication you get with family. And we learned that in the space shuttle program and also in the International Space Station program. We have what's called an IP phone or an internet protocol phone on the space station where, you know, the astronauts can call home. Um, and initially we patted ourselves on the back and we thought, oh, this will be great. They can talk to their family any time of day. This will be terrific. Uh, the problem is, uh, you know, the astronauts are working on, on things on the International Space Station and sometimes problems from home creep up onto the space station. Uh, so it's, uh, if you can imagine, somebody calls and, and gets a hold of their wife, and their wife says, hey, you said you were going to work on this roof or call the roofer before you left. I, on the next time the space station's over in the United States, I need you to call the roofer. Uh, and by the way, Johnny got a D on algebra, and you're the one who tutors him in algebra, so next time you have a pass on the space station, I need you, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we had to make sure that they learned that lesson as well, that there's, there is such a thing as too much communication with the outside world when you're in a disaster or crisis situation. You want to be able to reassure your family and you want to have that psychological support being able to talk to your family, but you don't want the problems from the outside creeping into the mine or creeping into the space station either. And so you have to have, hit a happy medium there on that communication and psychological support. 
So now the rescue phase, and I'll, I'll wrap this up here soon because uh, I, I want to make sure we leave time for uh, questions, et cetera. You know, you, you know, are the miners at risk for the bends? The answer is no. Remember, they were at sea level. Uh, and so if you're in a mine, essentially you're saturated. You, you, the calculation that we have is you multiply in an enclosed space uh, times 3.3 .3 of, of uh, seawater. Um, and so if you were in a mine at 10 feet, uh, then you know, you'd multiply that and you'd have you know, times 3.3, .3, and you could figure out if that's equivalent uh, to or above or below 17 feet of seawater. But since they're at sea level, uh, you know, they were equivalent to 3.3 .3 feet of seawater, and so they were not at risk for DCS. Uh, now, unfortunately, not all the press knew that, and so on CNN they had uh, miners at risk for the bins. And uh, I unfortunately uh, did an interview, uh, and I forgot to say, okay, this is off the record, uh, but the reporter from the New York Times said, are, are the uh, miners at risk for bins? And I said, oh, no, that guy's crazy. They're not at risk for bins. Uh, and I think they had quoted a, a Harvard professor as who CNN had gone to. And unfortunately, the professor didn't know that the miners were at sea level. And so I pretty much told uh, the world, and he printed it in the New York Times, that uh, the guy from Harvard was crazy. Um, so after I had to go back to uh, public affairs school after that uh, to make sure I give interviews uh, correctly, uh, but that, you know they were not at risk for bends, and so we had to worry about what are the what are they at risk for when they come up. Well, you know right now they're well nourished. Uh, in fact, they've been watching soccer games down the mine. They've got clean clothes. They've been showering. They're well fed. Uh, and, and you're trying to bring them up. The thing you worry about as you're coming up in this tube, you're coming up from 2,400 feet, and you don't know how fast that tube's going to be able to move, and they're standing at attention, essentially, standing up in this tube. Well, you've seen 20 and 21 year old soldiers who lock their knees and they get orthostatic hypotension and they pass out. Well, the problem is if you pass out when you're standing in a tube, you can't lay flat. Uh, and so you can actually, you know, have a decrease in blood flow to the right heart and cause dysrhythmias uh, by passing out, if you will, from orthostatic hypotension without the ability to lay flat and restore blood flow back to your heart and brain. And so we had to have uh, you know, some plans for how are we going to handle that if they got orthostatic hypotension. Uh, you could get hypoxia. Remember, it's a tube. And so if, the, if for some reason some rock trapped the tube as it's coming up, uh, you know, could they get hypoxic? Could they get hypercapnia? Uh, and hypercarbia, anxiety reaction. If you can imagine being in a 24 to 26 inch tube uh, coming up through solid rock and you can't see anything around you, uh, that claustrophobia, I mean, holy cow, that could, that could be horrible. So, uh, but would you give them something like uh, an anxiolytic like Valium or something else or would that complicate your orthostatic hypertension problem? And so, what are they, how do you combat those physiologic consequences? Well, we have things on the space shuttle like the compression garment. Uh, we give uh, salt tablets because fluid follows salt into the vascular space and so it can increase your fluid load. We give a fluid loading of uh, fluids uh, and salty fluids. Uh, and of course, sunglasses for UV protection. Of course, these folks have been in a mine for 67 to 69 days. Uh, we want to protect them from UV light as well to prevent them from having UVitis or snow blindness. Uh, because they had not been exposed to that. And so here's what we gave them as a fluid loading protocol. If you ever see the movie on the Chilean mine, it says this is the NASA diet. Well, it wasn't the NASA diet. We're giving fluids, uh, and the, the miraculous NASA diet was Gatorade Pro Series 1 uh, to increase the amount of salt and sodium to hold that fluid into the vascular space to prevent them from having orthostatic hypertension. And so now you're coming up and you, you got to design this cage now because there isn't a cage R us store uh, that you can go and, and, and build for Chilean miners. So you got to figure out what, what is this going to have? Are you going to have oxygen in it? Are you going to have a camera? Are you going to have two way communication? Are you going to have fans? Uh, and this is the skirting around the top of the mine. So you can see this is a tube they're coming up. Uh, and they're coming up uh, at uh, 2,400 feet. And so uh, you know, one of the things, we wrote the requirements, and this is one of the things that we decided to do, was we would write down some of the engineering requirements. And again, this is the brilliance of the Chilean government and their community, is they said, let's make it a competition again. Let's put out the requirements. Let's, let's tell them what the requirements are. Let's see who designs the best one, and let's take it. 
uh, and the design actually, the winners were actually the Chilean Navy uh, designed the, the, the pod, uh, but they used a lot of the NASA requirements. Well, how are we going to combat the orthostatic hypertension problem potentially? Well, what we did is, if you notice, when the miners came out, they were all wearing a harness, a rappelling harness, and that was in case this pod got stuck in the tube. Uh, if you notice that picture on the left, they could actually pull two handles and open the bottom of it and rappel back down into the safety of the mine uh, so that they would not be trapped in the tube getting orthostatic hypotension. And of course, we're getting two-way communication from them and monitoring them, uh, and they've got an oxygen supply and audio and video in there. And, and so we're, that was key also on the psychological aspect. Instead of giving them something like uh, diazepam or something that would relax them and potentially complicate the orthostatic hypertension, what we did was walk them through it and talk them through it. Okay, you're at 2,400 feet, now you're at 2,000 feet, now you're at 1,500 feet, now you're at 1,000 feet, you're 500 feet, get ready, put on your sunglasses, and that helped relieve some of their anxiety, or at least it did for 32 out of the 33 miners. I think the one guy that had the wife and the girlfriend uh, waiting for him uh, up on the surface might have gotten a little bit more nervous as he kept going up. But uh, for the majority of them, I think they did uh, yeah, extremely well from their anxiety standpoint. And then also to the Chilean's credit, one of the things they did was we essentially made a, a clinical practice guideline on the fly uh, and made something Six Sigma to where no matter how they looked, no matter how good they looked, they were all going to get put on a cot, they were all going to get an IV in what's called a banana bag with the multivitamin and minerals, and they were all going to get flown to the hospital to be evaluated. And that was really good to do because a lot of the miners, they came up looking really good, but they're high on epinephrine because they're excited that they're coming out of this mine. Uh, but what happened was, you know, after they got to the hospital, they crashed a little bit, and especially the diabetic or the COPD or, and some of the folks with uh, chronic uh, illnesses, they needed more, in, you know, uh, intensive care, if you will, to allow them to recuperate. But the fact that they treated each minor the same and, and, and had a clinical practice guideline for what they were going to do and how they were going to treat them and evaluated everybody, no matter how, how good they looked coming up, uh, also prevented several problems uh, and sequela with some of the minors. And so that was a great thing that they did. And again, yeah, treating them in a very Six Sigma fashion, uh, which is an engineering term for us. Um, and then the convalescence recovery and reintegration. And, you know, that, that's probably the hardest part is when somebody then is recovered and they're going on Letterman and they're, you know, they're, they're running in marathons and it looks like they're fine. But as you can imagine, there's some PTSD from being trapped in a mine for 69 days. And, and uh, when the press is first interviewing you and you've got interviews and the lights on and et cetera, you probably don't think about that. But then when you're alone at night in the darkness of your room at night and nobody's calling anymore in the press, is no longer calling, and it's just you and your demons at night. Uh, you know that's when the PTSD is is worrisome. And so, uh, you know, the Chilean health authorities needed uh, to realize, and, and we had talked about this and collaborated on this, that the mission's not over once they reach the surface. That there is going to be a long-term mission to help these folks uh, get back into society and get over the depression and PTSD that would accompany this. Uh, and so. You know, in conclusion, they, they did a phenomenal job, and there was a combination of innovation, leadership, and the mindset from the government and the, and the medical and mining personnel. There were also lessons from spaceflight that allowed us uh, to consult and give them some tips on what we would see and how we would do this that were some crossover that even we didn't expect that there would be that much crossover, uh, but it was a very tangible benefit for us and for them, uh, and obviously a very successful story. And so. You know, with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian and see if there's any questions. But, uh, you know, my hat's off. And really, this is a story about the, the greatest uh, achievement and triumph that the Chilean health authorities did. We were privileged to be able to consult, but this is really their success. Any questions at all? Wow, thank you so much, J.D. And that's a wonderful photograph of you. That's you just on, the pre on President Obama's left there, uh, second from the right in the lineup. Yep. Uh, what, what a great story, and the, the, the uh, chat box has been full of uh, comments, and I'll come to them just in a moment. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. But let's bring in uh, Catherine. Uh, good afternoon, Catherine. Great to have you on board. Hello, Brian. Hello, J.D., and hello to everyone else online. Thank you very much, J.D., for that absolutely fascinating um, story. My um, 
Uh, children and I watched this day by day when every um, the, the, the miners started to be nearly to be to be rescued, and it it it, it was such an emotional uh, rescue at the at the time. Even watching it miles and miles away at home in in Edinburgh, and we I told the children that you were going to be talking about it, and they were they were remembering and reliving, I suppose, what we we thought what it would have been like to see your family again after all that time and maybe thinking that you never would again. So what a fantastic um, story that you have brought to us and, and, and been part of that success. So I thank you and, and the team for, for that effort, but also for sharing that with us. I, was, I wanted JD to, to comment first on, I, I, I like the comments about the, um, about the cigarettes, and I think that that um, personalised approach to, to humanely deal with, with cigarettes, maybe not the most healthy, but that was what people were needing in a, in a, a difficult situation. So that's real realistic, realistic medicine. But what I'm fascinated by is, is a team coming from outside Chile, or we could think about a team coming from outside wherever we all work, with a, an expertise that was different and that the Chilean people said, well, we rescue miners all the time. This happens all the time in our minds. How did, how did you persuade them that, that what you were going to offer was not um, treading on their toes, was not questioning their expertise, but actually was going to add, add value? And, and how, did you, how did you work with them around some of those sensitivities and, and tensions that there, there may have been? That's a great question, Dr. Calderwood. Yeah, the one thing that amazed me, I anticipated that there would be that kind of, uh, you know, a wall between us or, or they'd be like, oh, great, here comes NASA, you know, yeah, 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 you guys are going to tell, we, we know how to do this. It was actually the opposite. Um, and, I, and I guess that goes to, you know, on, on one of the, the uh, the strategic aspects that you have on your realistic medicine quest is is you know getting that shared decision making, but that shared decision making takes a mindset in the beginning, and fortunately for us, the Chileans had the mindset in the very beginning. They were like, okay, we think we know how to do this, and, and we've got some ideas ideas on this, but we want everybody's ideas. We want we we want all comers, uh, and that's in that one slide where you see us all talking each day uh, where in our tag up to see where the drill was and, and what were things were going on. Uh, to their credit, they had a very open mindset and wanted a free sharing of ideas uh, and innovations going back and forth. And then, of course, they would pick and choose which ones that they, they were going to use, but they, they had the right mindset going in. They had a, a mindset of shared decision making and open innovation from the get-go. We didn't have to convince them to take that approach. Um, and they had that approach from the beginning. And so that, that really, I think, uh, you know, getting that mindset established, as, as I'm sure you've found as the chief medical officer, um, you know, getting that culture established to start to where, you know, hospitals or doctors or practitioners are open to that shared decision making and that open innovation. That's probably the biggest hurdle, but fortunately for us, they had it from the get-go. That, that, that's brilliant, brilliant to hear, and I suppose everybody was, was, was after one aim, which was to get everybody out of the mine safely, and, and that, I think that shared goal is, is so important. Thank you, J.D. No, my pleasure. Thanks very much, Catherine. And we see from the chat box, so um, uh, Sabita uh, Sabanda, who's a patient safety coordinator in Western New South Wales in Australia, uh, making a, the point that uh, the story tells it seems to tell the story of great leadership on both sides, which is perfectly lined up. And to the point around um, um, sharing ideas, um, uh, Elaine Mead, chief executive of NHS Highland here in, in Scotland making the point that uh, one of their mottos is to steal shamelessly uh, with regard to welcoming in other people's ideas. However, here's a, a question here from Tim Priest. Now, Tim is a specialist in flood inc incident management. 
in DEFRA. DEFRA is the uh, government department for environment, flood, and rural affairs. Now, he's a specialist in flood emergencies, and his question was really, uh, I'm wondering if the mining company has an emergency plan for this type of incident in place, and whether they sought advice from other mining companies. Well, that's a, that's a good question, and, and I think, unfortunately, you know, I think people think they have a plan, and, and maybe initially you have a great plan, and of course, you know, they had put some supplies down there for a cave-in, et cetera, but, but I don't think, unless you, you know, there's an old adage in the military, and I'm sure he's seen this in flood management too, unless you train like you fight, unless you train like the actual incident that's going to occur, uh, you're always going to fall short a little bit. And so I, I think uh, probably it's true throughout most of the mining industry, uh, there could be an improvement in some of the things that they have in the shelters uh, and, you know, all of the different equipment that they have, but they also need to practice and train for a cave-in and what will happen. And, and you need to figure out where those gaps are uh, and try to fill those. And uh, sometimes that takes a lot of money. Uh, you know, a lot of those things, the, you know, to get a really complex shelter and, and all those food stores that are going to uh, then uh, expire and you have to replace them. And so, you know, that, that eats into the bottom line for companies, too. They're trying to make a profit off of mining. And so, the, you know, they have to have the right mindset, and, and they also have to train like they're going to fight. And I think that's probably the biggest lesson for many of the mining companies. And I don't know that a lot of them do it that well. I, you know, I don't, I, admittedly, I don't want to, you know, castigate them without having seen their facilities and what happens, but we've heard about numerous different uh, mine collapses, et cetera, and, and they don't always have a positive ending like this one did. Um, and so my, I suspect that uh, there's always room for improvement there. Great. Thank you very much for that, J.D. And uh, just by, uh, by design, uh, Maria uh, uh, Zeriga, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, who's actually Chilean uh, and working in uh, uh, the Royal Bournemouth Hospital in England, is just commending you in a great talk describing so powerfully uh, what happened in her homeland. So well done, JD. Um, we, we've also got uh, some comments here from Ian Keith, who's a consultant physician in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and also Laura mm -hmm. Harvey who's the quality, improve, uh, quality Improvement Lead in NHS, uh, Ayrshire Marin. They were very taken with the whole physiological rebalancing that you were doing, and they wondered whether we do any of that dietary manipulation or other things for um, hypercapnic or, or patients with, uh, with uh, respiratory failure in our wards. Do you, do you know whether we've, we do that in our wards, in our hospitals? You know, I, I imagine that there is some balancing. A lot of it is now done by computer and algorithms. And of course, you know, Brian, when you and I were coming up, uh, we were doing this by hand. And I, I remember, you know, rotating through the ICU and having to calculate all the fats and lipids and, and protein and doing all the calculations and fill out all the TPN paperwork. And, and now a lot of that, uh, you know, the new generation uh, is, is clicking on a computer and it's done a lot of them for it. Um, and I know that they do have certain diets and protocols for COPD and respiratory failure patients, which I imagine has an RQ that shifts uh, closer to uh, 0.8 as opposed to uh, 1. Um, but exactly how that computer algorithm works and, and how much of it, uh, it, it gives, uh, I'm not really sure. But I know, that, at least from my experience in the wards and in the ICU, uh, certainly in the ER when we were writing orders for somebody to go up to the uh, ICU, there were different diets based on whether somebody was a diabetic or whether somebody was COPD or somebody was X. Uh, and so uh, there are ways uh, to manipulate that TPN um, to, to do that. Uh, of course, they, you don't have to worry in the hospital or the war, wards about uh, producing too much CO2 into the room, no, no one's going to asphyxiate from the CO2 that the patient's off-gassing, and you don't have to worry about the supply of oxygen because there seems to be a never-ending supply out of the wall uh, oxygen outlet. So there's some different confounding factors versus what happens in space or in a mine. Uh, but I know that they do manipulate the RQ and, and the calories uh, for different patients uh, on the ward. Brilliant. And we've had some comments on the chat from uh, from Maureen Leith, who's, who's the head of uh, dietetics, actually, in NHS Lanarkshire. So she's been making some 
very positive uh, comments mm -hmm. as we've gone through the talk. Now, listen, I see comments from uh, from uh, Stuart Lambie, uh, SPSP fellow and the nephrologist in NHS Highland. And maybe we just finish with this or a, a, a summary of his question. Really, he's asking, so what happened to the miners afterwards? Uh, did, did many of them go back to work? You know, uh, at least for the follow-up that we had with them, uh, no, and there's, this is no surprise, but nobody went back uh, into the mine uh, at the six month and one year mark. Uh, they still had not returned any of them to uh, the mine. Um, and that, that does not surprise me. Now, would I be surprised that, uh, you know, four or five would eventually return to the mine since that is, is a big economic force down, down there in their region? No, it wouldn't surprise me. But um, you know, some of them had actually gone into, uh, uh, they were actually working for the mining company on, on teaching how to survive in a mine and teaching disaster management for miners and the leadership on, on, on some of the things and skills that they use to survive there. Uh, and so uh, that was probably the biggest example I had seen of, of folks using this in a positive way to try to make a change and to, uh, to assure the survival of those behind them. Uh, but to my knowledge, and again, it's, it's been several years now, I have not followed up with my colleagues there in a while, uh, they had not returned to the mine. Yeah, thanks for that, JD. Uh, so many other comments, many other um, uh, 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 congratulations to you and bring me a new perspective uh, to the story, an untold or unheard perspective. Manoj Kumar, a consultant surgeon in uh, NHS Grampian uh, and a national clinical lead with us is uh, just saying what a great story. Um, uh, just uh, the, um, the chat box is full. Look, we've come to the end of our time, JD, but of course what you've done now is you've given us this inspiration to pick up the phone to NASA for some of our complex issues that we have <laughs> uh, across health and social care. So, and I haven't uh, even told you, I haven't even told you, Brian, how we do health care at NASA, so now you have to invite me back. That's it. You're on. You're on the case. We'll get you back to your family hometown, uh, not so, not too far away from here. Uh, big thank you to Catherine Cordwood. Big thank you to J JD. We're coming to the end, folks. Thanks for sticking with us. Absolutely delighted to be saying that uh, Nirav Shah, um, uh, who was uh, the uh, chief operating officer with Kaiser Permanente, is joining us in uh, in February. Uh, Nirav is just transit, transiting, uh, sorry, transitioning just now uh, to Stanford Medicine, uh, Stanford University around uh, disruptive medicine. Uh, and Nirav is joining us uh, in next month. And the lineup, uh, JD has all, already called out Atul Gowandi and Tobo, Toby Cosgrove, uh, but many wonderful speakers this the, this year's uh, QI Connect. So remember. Follow us on Twitter, tweet about today's talk, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you all very much indeed.